to continue with our series today on being renewed, and today the choice that lies before us is isolation or fellowship. Uh, back in 2023, uh, Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy uh, published this paper called Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation. And let me share some of, the, some of the words from the opening of this uh, document. So these are the words of Dr. Murthy, the Surgeon General of the United States. When I first took office as Surgeon General in 2014, I didn't view loneliness as a public health concern. But that was before I embarked on a cross-country listening tour where I heard stories from my fellow Americans that surprised me. People began to tell me they felt isolated, invisible, and insignificant. Even when they couldn't put their finger on the word lonely, time and time again, people of all ages and socioeconomic backgrounds from every corner of the country would tell me, I have to shoulder all of life's burdens by myself. Or, if I disappear tomorrow, no one will even notice. It was a light bulb moment for me. Social disconnection was far more common than I had realized. In the scientific literature, I found confirmation of what I was hearing. In recent years, about one in two, 50% of adults in America reported experiencing loneliness. And that was before the COVID-19 pandemic cut off so many of us from friends, loved ones, and support systems exacerbating loneliness and isolation. Loneliness is far more than just a bad feeling. It harms both individual and societal health. It is associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, stroke, depression, anxiety, and premature death. The mortality impact of being socially disconnected is similar to that caused by smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day, and even greater than that associated with obesity and physical inactivity. It's amazing that loneliness can affect us on such a physical level in our bodies. I imagine many of us resonate with this observation. We're not just aware uh, that people out there are feeling disconnected. We ourselves feel this. We live it. In her book, A Simple Path, Mother Teresa wrote, the greatest disease in the West today is not TB or leprosy, it is being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. We can cure physical diseases with medicine, but the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love. There are many in the world who are dying for a piece of bread, but there are many more dying for a little love. That book was published in 1995, almost 30 years ago. Before most homes had a PC, before iPhones, before streaming entertainment, I think we would all assume the problem has only become worse since then. Not only have I felt this disconnection and isolation, I have contributed to it. I catch myself selfishly isolating from others, scrolling on my phone, eating meals not around the table but in front of the TV, hiding behind the label of introvert, right? We can justify it socially now. I'm just an introvert. I don't have to talk to anyone. I don't have to be with anybody. I also realize that I have in some sense encouraged my children to be isolated from me and from each other. Another byproduct of my own selfishness. Electronic devices were not the best developmental tool for them, 
They were simply a convenient path for me. If they were engaged with a show or a game, they didn't need so much of my attention. I taught them to isolate instead of inviting connection. Parenting is fraught with pitfalls, disappointments, and regrets. Thank the Lord my children also have a mother who's better at parenting than me. <clears throat> so our theme verse for this series is Romans 12, 1 and 2, where the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So are we going to be conformed or are we going to be transformed? Two paths, two choices lie before us. And today we ask ourselves, are we going to be conformed to the image of the world which is isolating us from one another or are we going to be transformed toward loving connection which is where God wants to lead us? God gives a feast in which everyone has a seat at the table. The world gives us fast food, alone, in our cars. God calls us together as the ecclesia, the church. The world, especially suburbia, encourages us to go into our homes, which are our castles, meant for our protection and leisure, and those castles quickly become fortresses where we are cut off from everyone else. God gives us marriage. The world tries to steer us toward divorce, separating what God has joined together. God gives pregnancy and childbirth the incredible bond between mother and child. The world destroys it with abortion. God gives life and friendship and family. The enemy leverages sin so he can use his most formidable weapon of separation, namely death. The world, influenced by the lies of the enemy, is moving us away from loving connection with God and with others. That's what it looks like to be conformed to the image of this world. But God wants to transform us toward loving connection with himself and with others. So those are the choices on the table today, church. The Surgeon General's report highlighted some of the ways isolation and loneliness are harming us, but there's a more fundamental issue at stake that we must consider. Now, we're going to have to do a few moments of deep diving into Scripture and theological reflection. So, ready? Deep breath, Asher. Come on, come along for the ride. Everyone take a deep breath. Here we go. Just relax. We can do it together. Okay, let's go back to the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1. God said, let us make human beings in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Now, theologians have thought long and hard about what it means that human beings are created in the image of God. That seems like a pretty important idea, yes? What does this mean that we're created in the image of God? Many Christian thinkers believe the way we are like God is in our capacity to reason, in our ability to make decisions, in our ability to cause things to happen. And these are certainly ways we are like God. God is a rational being. 
he causes things to happen according to his will, and we are like God in that way. But more recently, some scholars are looking into the image of God in light of the Trinity, which we were singing about earlier. As God continued to reveal himself to his people, he finally sent his son, Jesus, who is the best revelation of God we have ever had. And through Jesus and, and through his followers, we have come to learn that God himself exists as three distinct persons who share one nature. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. So, God exists in relationship. God exists in community. God exists in fellowship. This is who our God is. He himself is a relationship. He himself is community. He himself is fellowship. Perhaps what it means to be made in God's image is that we, too, are designed to live in relationship with others. In Genesis 2, we have another uh, account of the creation. And in this story, Adam is alone in the garden. And God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. Why was it not good for Adam to be alone? In part because Adam on his own does not accurately reflect who God is. Are you with me? <laughs> Adam on his own is not imaging the God who truly exists because that God is not alone. That God is three in one. So for Adam to take up his vocation of imaging this God, he cannot do it alone. He must have a helper who corresponds to him. Moving into the New Testament, we read in 1 John, Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is, God is love. God is love. So would you agree that to be made in his image, that must have something to do then with love? If we're going to be made in the image of a God who is love, it must have something to do with love. Jesus, when asked about the most important commandment, said what? Love the Lord your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And there's another command that's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So love is the number one priority, according to Jesus. Can we love in isolation from others, church? Isolating is the opposite of the movement that God wants to see in our lives. And the world is telling us that we can have these connections virtually on Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and email and text messaging, but come on, church, we know better than that. That's nothing but a pale substitute for real connection. Those things are what isolated people do to try to make themselves feel like they're connected when, in fact, they are not connected. That's not the kind of connection and fellowship that God is calling us to. And look, I get it. Isolation is way less messy, way less time-consuming way less demanding, way less expensive in terms of money and effort and investment and the potential to be hurt by others. And if we do nothing, we will end up isolated because that is the direction of the world. That is the pressure that the world is exerting. That is the current of the stream of the world. Do nothing and you will end up isolated. 
But church, we are not made for isolation. Say amen. We are not made for isolation. We are made for relationship, for fellowship, for connection. Isolation is not good for us, and it causes us to fall short of the most important thing Jesus commands us to do, which is love God and love others, and it robs us of our vocation of imaging the triune God into the world, the God who exists in fellowship, freely giving and receiving love among the members of the Trinity. So we have to exert effort to not end up isolated. We have, to, we have to make an effort toward fellowship, toward connection. Jesus says in John 13, people will know you are my disciples because of what? The way you love each other. People are going to look at that and they're going to say, Jesus is behind that. These people are apprentices of Jesus because they're the only ones who love like that. As we close, let me suggest two practices that God gives that help pave the way toward the transformation he wants us to see in our lives. Now, I could mention a lot of things right here. I could point you toward our small groups as a means of connection. I could point you toward our discipleship groups, which are just getting started. I could point you toward uh, Sunday morning worship and Wednesday evening learning and fellowship and the meal we share together. Those are all great opportunities for connection and fellowship. I'm going to mention a couple of other things, however, in addition to all of those things. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. This is a description of the way the early church, the very first Christians in the city of Jerusalem, this is how they were living their lives. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That's, there's a lot there, okay? We could just camp out there and really dig in and explore Uh, a lot of those ideas. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now, all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. What a bunch of communists. That's how they did it. That's how they did it. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together. How often? Every day. They they happened to bump into each other? No, they, they were choosing a life together. They were devoted to the practice of saying, After we get off of work, we're all going down to the temple on Solomon's porch and we're meeting together. That's where the meeting is. I will see you there. Every day, these people devoted themselves to being together. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So this is a description of the life of the early church. And here's the practice I want to suggest to you today as being important as a move toward connection and fellowship. Here it is. Ready? Eat together. Anybody interested? Eat together. It's right here. It's right here. And that's an easy one to overlook. We might say, well, that's kind of incidental, isn't it? I mean, we all eat and blah, blah, blah. No. You know, Luke includes it here, and he calls it out, and he says, this is something that they devoted themselves to, sharing meals together. There's something about sitting around the table with others and sharing a meal that is spiritually significant. 
It's something that God's people have been doing for thousands and thousands of years. And I do feel like this is something that is quietly eroding as the world pushes us toward isolation. More and more, we're eating by ourselves. More and more, we're eating in front of screens. So, in a countercultural move, church, I want to encourage you to share meals together. Share meals with your family. Share meals with this family. Share meals with people outside of your family and this family. Invite them to your table. Can your home, can your dining room table become a place where relationships are fostered? Church, I want you to recognize that your dining room table is a sacred, holy, and spiritually significant place. Your dining room table is a sacred, holy, and spiritually significant place for your family and for this family. I want you to do something right now. I want you to envision in your mind's eye the place where in your home where you share meals. I want you to envision that place. I want you to think about your dining room table, and I want to ask God to bless our dining room spaces, okay? You see it in your mind. Lord God, help us to recognize that a table with food, with people sitting around it, is a space that you come to inhabit. When we share your good gifts of food and fellowship, oh God, would you bless these table spaces in each of our homes? Make them places of deep fellowship and conversation, and openness, and connection, places where we connect not only with one another, but deeply as well with you. Would you give us a vision for the good that can be done around those tables? Would you cause us to commit to sharing times with our own families around those tables? Would you also lead us, O oh God, to invite others into our homes to share times of fellowship around those tables. We pray, God, that they would become transformative spaces in our homes and in our lives as you use them. We ask for this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Your dining room table is a sacred, holy, spiritually significant place. Share meals together. Finally, uh, Romans 12, 3 through 10. Now, these are the verses that follow right after the theme verses that we've been looking at through the whole series, right? These are the verses that come right after that. Paul says, for by the grace given me, and when he says for, he's, he's connecting this back to the idea of offering our bodies as living sacrifices. He's connecting this with the idea of not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can understand what God's will is. What he's going to say right now is connected to those important ideas. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. So verses 3 and 4, Paul says, let me begin by saying that you should each have some humility. Don't think of yourself as better than everybody else. Think of yourself with sober judgment and in humility. Now, as we have many parts in one body and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. What? Like, that's not a sentence you just skirt by and keep going. That's one that stops us in our tracks and says, 
we individually are members of one another. I belong to you. You belong to me. We are connected in some mysterious spiritual way in the same way that the different parts of my body are connected to each other. Wow. Wow. So we're not coming in here as just a collection of individuals. When I look around the room, I'm looking at members of my own body. And I belong to you and you belong to me in ways that makes it impossible for us to say, I get to do whatever I want. I'm a lone ranger. I'm doing it on my own. No. Paul reminds us we have a significant connection because we are connected in Christ. And dare I say, it sounds like the kind of connection that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It sounds like an image of who God is that Jesus creates through the Spirit in his body, this interconnection that we have. So we're, truly we are not isolated, and if we act like we're isolated, we're acting not according to who we truly are according to Jesus. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy... Use it. Use it. According to the proportion of one's faith, if service, use it in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, use it in exhortation. If you have a gift of giving, give with generosity. If you can lead, lead with diligence, showing mercy with cheerfulness. So, here's the last thing I want to say. One way to embrace the transformation that God wants to work in us toward fellowship, away from isolation, is to serve one another in love. The pathway God has marked out for you toward transformation to become like Jesus is laid with stones of serving and if you are isolating yourself from the body of Christ, and if you are not serving your brothers and sisters in Christ, then you are missing out on some of the transformation God wants to work in your life. Because part of the way he changes us is when we will come in humility and place ourselves underneath the people in this room and say, I am here to serve you in love. I'm here to use my gifts that the Spirit has given me and I want to use them in a way that's going to help build you up. And we don't do that in isolation, and we can't do it in isolation. And if we are isolating, then the body is missing out on all of its fullness that God intends for it. So, part of the movement toward fellowship is to use our gifts to serve. It's not a complicated idea. It's just a hard idea to actually follow through with. Again, because why? It takes time. It takes effort. It takes commitment. It takes a lot of things uh, rather than sitting on the couch to get with these people and figure out what is it that I have to bring that's going to help them grow. But part of this journey, remember, is discerning the good and pleasing and perfect will of God. And part of that is figuring out what does that pathway look like for me? What are the gifts that God has given to me? What are the good works that God has laid out for me in advance that I'm supposed to be walking in? These are questions that faithful Christians need to ask over and over and over again in every season of life because none of us is designed to sit on the sidelines. We're all designed for fellowship and connection and serving one another. Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters, take the lead in honoring one another. Church, this is the choice before us today. Live lives of isolation or move toward fellowship and connection. 
connecting is not easy, but it's more important than Netflix. It's more fulfilling than scrolling on your phone. It's what you were created to do, and it's who you are designed to be. And church, I can't help but think, in a culture that is suffering and struggling in an epidemic of loneliness and isolation, this should be our time to shine. We are the love people. We are the fellowship people. We are the people who ourselves have been invited to the table by Jesus, and he says, everyone can have a seat. And we should turn around and look around and say, who hasn't found their place at the table yet? Come on, you're invited too. So may our love and our fellowship and our sharing of meals and our serving one another shine like a light into the darkness of loneliness and isolation. Amen? Amen. Pray with me. God, this moment is a moment for your church, is a moment for your son to infuse us with the love that you have among yourself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Share that love. Pour it into our hearts through your Holy Spirit that we might overflow with it for one another in this body of Christ and that it will spill out from us onto the people we work with and study with and play with. God, may our lives somehow be a light that shows forth that isolation, loneliness, there's more than that. God, move us away from that toward connection and help us to be agents who help others find the love in your body of Christ. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.